Great. Um, so let me just play this here. Uh, thank you very much to um, the organizers for this incredible seminar series that has really sustained us through a difficult time with the pandemic. And thanks so much for the invitation. So I'm going to tell you today about some new work, and my title is a bit grandiose, so I, I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, so just trying to draw people in. Um, and so I am actually an applied mathematician, particularly I work in uh, numerical, computational applied math and scientific computing. And I'm really interested in understanding cell migration and particularly the fluid mechanics. We've had some great speakers like, you know, Mike Shelley and Ray Goldstein talk about fluid mechanics. I'm going to try to present a little bit different because it's really focused on, you know, intracellular uh, fluid flows. Um, so here's just some pictures of some simulations. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it succinct here and just tell you one story. But generally speaking, I am interested in fluid mechanics in cell biology. And one example would be this amoeba, Entamoeba histolytica, which is a parasite um, that can cause a lot of issues if you get it. <laughs> um, so you can see that it kind of has this like cytoplasmic streaming type of motion as it, it moves around um, on the glass cover slip. And then another kind of example would be um, on the right. So I'll play the movie in a second. Um, this is actually a um, plankton cell in the ocean that uh, has uh, an organelle that actually um, fires like a harpoon to uh, capture prey. <laughs> so you'll see, you can see the little harpoon firing. So that's another case. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but that's just another example of maybe something you may not have seen before. And so this is more like, you know, getting stung by a jellyfish. They have the same type of organelle, it's called an nematocyst. So that's another problem I'm interested in studying. And that's more of a higher Reynolds number problem. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. So just some motivation. Uh, I know this group is pretty familiar with it, but cells need to move for a variety of different reasons. Um, so sperm cell reproduction uh, during embryogenesis, uh, wound healing, and uh, for some not so great reasons like cancer uh, metastasis. And so um, it's a critical function for life. And the traditional paradigm that most of us are used to understanding is that if you have a cell, you put it on a, a glass cover slip, and uh, then you have actin polymerization, which Kim just gave kind of like a little introduction to. So actin polymerization at the leading edge that generates the leading edge protrusion, adhesion to the substrate, and then uh, myosin-driven rear contraction in the rear. So you have this kind of cycle of uh, protrusion, adhesion, and retraction. And then I just put this uh, graphic from the from Tom Pollard that sh is showing the the structure, the highly you know conserved structure during a melopodia protrusion. And so this is a complicated process. Many people just work on mathematical modeling of, of just this kind of general two dimensional migration. So it does require a lot of coordination between signaling and cytoskeletal uh, components. And that would be more like our keratocyte, which is on the left. So you're, that's more of the, the previous slide type of migration. And on the right, you have this more like amoeboid uh, sort of blebby type of migration. And so that's actually a cell with two nuclei that's migrating in a yolk um, and confinement between two layers of cells. So I'm more focused on the one on the right, uh, the 3D type of migration. But obviously a lot of great work has been done with the keratocyte type model. Okay, so here's another example of uh, cell migration in 3D, and this is getting into the whole idea of different migration modes. So on the left, we have the mesenchymal migration. Uh, so you kind of looks like a, a jungle gym. <laughs> so you see these actin protrusions in the front, and then um, the cell sort of like stretching out as it migrating, as it's migrating, and it's actually uh, degrading the collagen matrix around it as it migrates. And so in comparison on the right, you're gonna see it's still kind of like a jungle gym type of, you know, actin, like adhering and then pulling on the collagen. But it has this kind of rounder shape as it migrates through the matrix. Um, so that's one kind of type of geometry, the collagen matrix, uh, where you've got some different migration modes uh, after drug treatment. And then there in 3D, there's many different ways to migrate and, and Petri, Ryan Petrie and Ken Yamada have some excellent reviews that kind of go through the literature. Um, and they've shown that fibroblasts can use all different types of modes. Uh, so some use the use intracellular pressure. So I would say that in general, blebbing and amoeboid do have intracellular pressure variations that are important. 
Um, so there's this like pressure piston idea where the nucleus separates the cell into different compartments. So that's the 3D little podia model. Um, and then there's just cells that have a contractile rear, uh, such as this uh, Shi Yamada and Han paper, where you've got um, rear retraction, uh, myosin driven contraction, that's and cortical flows that are kind of driving migration through this three dimensional matrix. So it's not such so simple as protrusion. Uh, adhesion and retraction, it's a lot more like, okay, is adhesion important? So for some modes, three-dimensional modes it is, for some it isn't, it's thought not to be, um, at least in terms of specific integrin mediated adhesion. Uh, myosin contractility is really important. And then there's this idea of pressure, which you know I'll kind of get into a little bit um, in terms of what does that mean um, in terms of migration. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a lot about my model involves um, one aspect of it involves looking at cellular blebs um, as a leading edge protrusion for 3D migration. So just a quick introduction on what are blebs. So they're spherical membrane protrusions that are characterized by a separation of the, the membrane and the actin cortex. So again, when I say actin cortex, I mean the, the actin cytoskeleton that's normally like right next to the cell membrane that gives the cell its shape. And so we have um, proteins that link the membrane and the cortex together. And then we have the actomycin contractility that's generating um, tension inside of the cell. And then um, what happens is if you induce a blepsy by laser ablation, which is in this Tinevez paper um, from a while ago, but basically they take a laser uh, and ablate the cortex. And then because the cell is under this high tension, then we have cytoplasmic flow that drives membrane expansion. And in this particular cell type, it occurs on 30 seconds and reforms on a time scale of several minutes. This can happen fact, faster in different cell types like dictyostelium. Okay, and then another, uh, we kind of saw the jungle gym through the collagen matrix, 3D migration, but a simpler form that a lot of people consider as like a stepping stone to full 3D migration is confined migration. And so um, on the left, what you're gonna see is um, on the top is actin and on the bottom is myosin. And so you're seeing a blebbing cell, this is actually the cancer cell, that's migrating uh, under confinement. So you can see blebs in the front and a contractile rear, uh, myosin rear in the back. So you can see it's migrating through the channel. Uh, and so in terms of like trying to understand things, I should say that this, this paper from Ava Paulus lab that they do have a really nice model for cortical flow that explains um, some of their experimental observations. Um, so again, being that I'm interested in um, fluid flow, one of the questions that we wanted to look at, my collaborator on this project and I was, what about the cytoplasmic streaming aspect of it? Because most of the modeling is really focused on keeping, um, just like having a force balance type model or, um, even treating just pressure as constant throughout the cell body. So what happens if you relax that assumption? And so the idea is for how a cell can migrate, a blebbing cell can migrate under um, these conditions under confinement would be um, a cortical flow, which is similar to the Pollock model um, where actin flow, and then you have adhesion between the walls and potentially other cells that's able to drive migration. And then the other idea out there is the chimney model where somehow hydrostatic pressure uh, the, using normal type forces more than tangential uh, forces, uh, the cell can kind of wedge itself through gaps um, and then somehow migrate. So that's kind of what we want to explore is like, how is this, is this possible um, if we let the pressure vary and then we have um, cytoplasmic streaming that's not going to be uniform in the cell body. Okay, so before I get into that, um, I did want to talk a little bit about the Reynolds number. So that's the ratio of inertia to viscous forces. So mu here is the fluid viscosity, rho is density, u would be the characteristic velocity, and then L would be a characteristic length scale. So it's an undimensional parameter that tells you a little bit about what you can expect in terms of the, the fluid mechanics of the problem. And so because of the small length scales involved in cells that generally the Reynolds number is very, very small. And so we usually set it equal to zero. So we're in this very overdamped viscous regime uh, and the flow is actually reversible. So in order to swim, quote unquote, which you'll, we'll get into what that means in terms of cell migration, 
that we have the scallop fairing that we have to deal with. So we're gonna need at least two degrees of freedom to swim if I'm just a cell immersed in viscous fluid. And that's why bacteria have these tails. Um, and I just wanted to play a quick video on this. Uh, there's a YouTube video about two swimmers. So just to kind of show you what we're up against here. So I'm gonna just switch over to that real quick. I already have it queued up. So we've got two swimmers here. Um, so we have um, the dolphin, and I just turned the sound off, I'll narrate. <laughs> we have the dolphin and then we have the twisting arms. And so the dolphin has um, like the scallop. So it's kind of flapping to move and this is just in water. So it's able to swim effectively. And then the other guy is also able to swim because he can rotate his flappers. And so now they're doing a very viscous fluid, which is uh, glycerol, I think, or glycerine, something like that. <laughs> so they're increasing the viscosity here, so glycerol. So we've got much more viscous, much smaller Reynolds number here. And so we're gonna see our dolphin friend is gonna have some trouble. So he's kind of stuck in there. So that's uh, our reversible motion. So we can see uh, he gets stuck and then we'll just take a look at the other swimmer. So you can see that he's able, he's a different type of motion and he's able to migrate or swim effectively in the very viscous uh, medium. So he wins the race. So I guess that's the lobster. So the dolphin is not effective. So let me get out of there. And it's fun to look uh, at YouTube for these ideas, especially if you're teaching. Okay, so that's just something that we need to consider um, from a modeling point of view. So we need those two degrees of freedom. So a scallop opening and closing is like the dolphin and that's not gonna work for a little Reynolds number. Okay, so um, some questions we wanna try to address with our mathematical model. Um, how can a cell migrate without specific, so integrin type adhesions or you know any sort of, so it's not clear whether or not we have absolutely no adhesion or just some general like so weak, weaker adhesion. Um, and how do you intracellular pressure gradients help or hinder, I would say help or hinder cell migration in 3D environments? So we'll take a look at that. And uh, we wanna understand the mechanical contributions of the different um, components in the model. So namely the cytoplasm, the cortex and potentially fluid that's outside of the cell. And then we also wanna take a look at myosin, which is obviously really important for generating intracellular pressure that's then vary throughout a bloating cycle. And then how can a cell overcome the scallop theorem? All right, so um, the model that uh, we formulated here is a cell within a rigid channel geometry. So we've got the blebbing model. So the blebbing cell put it inside of the rigid channel. And then we just have these outer walls that just has to do with the numerical method and trying to not resolve super thin boundary layers near the, the rigid channel. So that's kind of a technicality. So you have to focus on maybe the right. And um, just in the model, we're gonna actually gonna have uh, new, what we call new cortex and old cortex. And those are treated as spatially uniform within those two regions. And so we just have some differential equations to describe uh, their dynamics. So this is just a little movie to show uh, the blood expanding. And then um, after we specify a certain time and then the blood begins to retract. So that is a, a parameter that we're setting in terms of the retraction time. Okay, so the cell model is just based off uh, earlier model that I formulated for just blood expansion. Um, and then in this work, we extended it with the, the retraction. So basically you have an elastic and viscoelastic <laughs> cortex um, and also membrane. And so the largest parameter, the most important one is gonna be the surface tension term on the cortex that represents the actomycin contractility. Then we have forces that um, attach the membrane and the cortex. So those are like the membrane cortex adhesion. So like ERM proteins. And we are very careful in this model to uh, make sure that all of our forces balance. Um, so we have, uh, the cortex is actually a permeable structure. So the cytosol or the cytoplasm can flow through it. So we have a force balance where the drag is equal to uh, the sum of the, the negative sum of the other forces. 
So we have this kind of drag term uh, that takes into account the difference between the velocity, the fluid velocity and the cortical velocity. And so um, we've got the fluid equations and the membranes um, part of the fluid equations. And then we have a separate force balance on the cortex because it's a permeable structure. Um, and so there is cytosol inside and then there's fluid outside of it. It's fluid structure interaction problem. Okay, so in terms of um, numerically simulating it, so we have the mechanics of the structure that um, then cause a fluid flow and then the fluid flow feeds back onto the motion of the structure. Um, and so to do that, we use uh, the method of regularized Stokeslets. Um, and so because we have these rigid channels, we just have to be a little bit careful in terms of making sure that we formulate the problem correctly. So the nice thing about working in Stokes flow is that it's linear. And so um, you can compute based on the constitutive equation. So you want to say I have a linear elastic you know, cortex. I can compute the force at a point, And then I can basically you know, regularize. I treat it as like a point force and then numerically kind of regularize it. And then I can add up those point forces and then compute the fluid flow through like a matrix vector product. Um, so with the channel wall, it's a little bit different because we have to impose a no flow boundary condition. So we just have to make sure we formulate the problem correctly to then be able to compute the velocity of the cell in this combined system. So we've got the cell, we have the, the channel, and then we everything's um, interacting with one another through solving this linear system for the velocity. And then we can compute the velocity you know, anywhere because <laughs> it's a boundary interval method. So um, the way that I have it right here is just computing the velocity of the cell. Okay, so then what do we, the first thing we did was just, okay, let's just simulate the, the model with blood retraction and expansion. So first I'll show um, small blood, medium and large blood um, with a fixed channel width. Um, and that what you're looking at is pressure and, and Pascal's and the velocity arrows just inside of the cell. Um, so it can be evaluated outside of the cell as well. And also, so you can kind of see it's not going anywhere. And then we have our narrow cell and then, so just decreasing the channel width and then increasing the channel width. And so it looks quite reversible. And so um, then the question is, is this just a, a scallop? Is it just a reversible situation, time reversible uh, deformation? Okay, so well, we took a look at um, the displacement of the centroid over time. So the centroid of the membrane and uh, did basically just linearly squares over the first um, few cycles of it and looked at the slopes. And so it did seem like there just in general was not a lot of motion happening. So that was that match what we kind of saw with the movies. And in fact, it looked for, um, for one of the channel. So the most confined channel actually looked like the cell was even going backwards a little bit. And so if we just kind of carefully look at the stages of expansion or traction, it generally does look like reciprocal motion. And so then the idea was like, okay, well, how can we break the symmetry um, with and keeping the same Stokes flow? So one, one idea that we had was to, to do a sawtooth geometry. Um, so just change the geometry of the channel. And then when you do that, um, basically it's interesting because you can, you can move a little bit. So this is the case where you get some motion and otherwise you get a little bit of motion with this. So it looks like the cell can actually jut itself into a gap, wedge itself into a gap, which is kind of like a chimney and then it can move a little bit there. And so here's just a movie showing that. So this is a relatively simplistic model. Uh, so it can't really get itself out of a gap once it's stuck into the gap. Um, so biologically speaking, it would wanna probably do something to get out of there. <laughs> um, you can see it just keeps on blabbing into that gap, doesn't really go anywhere. We, uh, we have about five minutes left just, just to let you know. Okay, um, thanks. Absolutely. Okay, so I will pick up the pace a little bit. Um, and so what basically we did, we thought, well, okay, we're simulating this over, you know, like the time scale of like a minute. So maybe actin turnover is important. So we can actually model the cortex as a vis Maxwell viscoelastic material. So spring and dash plot in series. So it's actually viscoelastic fluid. And so then what we get, um, we actually get some pretty nice migration motion. 
So basically the stress is relaxing over time. And so that's basically how you're breaking the symmetry of the problem so that you're no longer a scallop. You're like a scallop with like a shortened hinge over time. So that was pretty cool. Um, and so we thought, let's just get rid of, um, oops. Okay. So let me just get rid of the channel and just take a look at the cell just as like, is it actually swimming? And so um, just looking at what was happening with varying the, the act and turnover parameters, so the time scale for the, uh, the stress relaxation, what we see is that, uh, yes, um, it does look like the cell is actually swimming. Um, so, and then the confinement appears to be enhancing the swimming. So I'll just show some movies. And this is a case where um, on the left with viscoelasticity, the cell's able to migrate. And on the right, um, it's basically gets stuck in the same way that it did before. So viscoelasticity can't always guarantee motion. And this is um, just showing a comparison between the elastic and the viscoelastic case. So for this um, sawtooth type channel, what we see is we get some motion, but you do get stuck after a while. Um, so we can run it out longer than 60 seconds and we basically the cell, it just becomes stuck. So it'll help you get to a certain point, but then you need something to kind of push yourself out of there. So in terms of looking at varying the viscoelasticity um, with the different geometries. So we uh, looked at the unconfined, the confined um, straight channel wall, and then the sawtooth with the um, it's high frequency, low amplitude case down here. And so we see that in certain regimes of actin term turnover, the sawtooth uh, velocity is higher than the other cases. And that if this 30 probably is the more realistic um, parameter in terms of uh, actin turnover. So this, in that case, the, the straight channel is best, but it's certainly not obvious, um, you know, just based on looking at it, you can't really tell which is the best. You kind of have to, to do the simulations and tell what's going on. So basically the conclusion is that viscoelasticity is really important for uh, this kind of confined blebbing based migration and that the cell has to swim to migrate. So I don't have a lot of time left. I do want to talk a little bit about the rear contraction. So I, I, that is thought to be really important in the blebbing motility cycle. So with the model, we can just isolate out the rear contraction. And so basically what I did is added uh, this rear contraction here. Uh, it's adding like another surface tension term to just the rear of the cell. And if we, you know, we can take a look at the movies here and basically you, this is cycles of rear contraction meant to model the blebbing cycle. And so we see that you basically don't get a lot of motion. You might actually move backwards in the, the narrow case. Um, and then also like you got a lot higher pressure for these cases than you did in the blebbing model because of the additional tension term. Um, and in terms of the, the changing the sawtooth, this actually really seems to disrupt the cortical flow and the cell's ability to migrate. Um, and in fact, you can actually move backwards, which is not great. Um, and so uh, with viscoelasticity, um, with the rear contraction, um, what's interesting is that this kind of contradicts some other data in literature. We get increased migration speed with confinement, which is contradictory to other results. Um, and so we, in this case, we actually have the cell moving backwards and then when we added viscoelasticity, the cell then moves forward in the right direction. So not that intuitive. So I'll just kind of summarize here um, with what I got with the, with the rear contraction case. Um, so generally um, it looks like if we just have cycles of rear contraction, the straight channel wall is the best. Um, but what's interesting is that um, so the pressure is more spatially uniform. The interest of the pressure is much higher. You're adding more energy to the system because you need this additional contraction compared to the blebbing mechanism. And just the speeds are much, much smaller compared to blebbing. So it looks like blebbing is just like a more effective way to migrate, at least um, at least on these you know, model simulations. Um, so there's a lot of future work that we can do. We can try varying the, the just what type of channel walls, the geometries, um, combining the different effects, um, take out the fluid and just look at a kind of a force, sum of forces model, um, hopefully extend to fully 3D. Everything I showed you here was 2D. And then hopefully find an experimentalist that is interested in these kinds of problems that wants to maybe work with us and, and test some hypotheses that we generated.
Um, so I just want to acknowledge my main collaborator on this project, Kalina Kobos. She's in uh, Northeastern University, and I believe she is looking for students and postdocs. Um, she's getting established there. And then um, just Alex McGillner and Bob Guy for some helpful discussions, and Bob gave us some code. And I will just, I have some other models. Um, and so this is just to show you that um, with some different mechanisms of motility, you can have high pressure in the front and then, um, and that actually can, intracellular, high, having high intracellular pressure in the front can actually like kind of inhibit your cell migration. So I have some other work too, but um, I'll, we'll save that for another time. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. Um, let's thank the speaker. Um, and we have a few minutes before the top of the hour for questions. So, and then, then we'll stop the recording and have a more informal discussion for uh, maybe another 10, 15 minutes if people have time. Um, so questions for Wanda. I have one, but we'll see if anybody wants to beat me to it here. Um, okay. Uh, so there's one question in the chat, for Ryan. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Yes. Um, so I do not have any specific wall adhesion interaction in the current form of the model. Um, and so any, so I will say that, so technically there should be no slip boundary condition at the wall. Mm -hmm. And technically, because we don't want to capture those super thin boundary layers between the cell and the wall, what we're doing is more of a no penetration with a little bit of slip. And so that's something that I'm going to look at is actually like how much slip is there and then how does that, you know, how can we look at the lubrication limit and make sure that we're okay because generally we're interested more in large scale we don't want to let those small scale effects and, you know, hinder our ability to even, you know, simulate these problems. But yes, there's no specific adhesion it's it's kind of like viscous drag in a sense but it, that's just coming from the fluid actually it's not coming from an additional drag term. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, any other, other questions? Um, I, I have a probably very, very broad one, you know, which really be, you know, asking questions about, you know, many decades of future research, but um, how would some of these um, issues be affected if you had um, migration of a group of cells? Um, say uh, either a bunch of you know uh, cancer cells or a you know, biofilm or something like that. Um, oh, so experimentally, they've seen that um, blebbing cells migrate more effectively when they can push off each other. So that was some mm -hmm. work from again from the Ava Paulus lab. Um, so they they show that you actually it's more effective to be clustered. So I think it is that pushing off each other is a, an effective migration strategy. That that's really that's really fascinating. Um, yeah, um, if you could, uh, what, what what paper was that? I'd love to. I'm, I'd like as well. Um, it was. Let's see. Um, it's zebra. It's a zebrafish paper, and I will. I can probably find it for you. Oh, no, 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 um, but yes, and in, in general, uh, so blebbing migration or this kind of fluid based is thought to be mm -hmm. um, evolutionarily speaking earlier than the actin based because it's just mechanically simpler. Right. Um, so yeah. Right. That's really, yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, so I, well, I see some questions there. Yeah, oh, some of the other. Okay. Yeah, that was. Um, and well, I guess since it's the top of the hour um, and the other organizers feel free to chime in about how to do this, I think we should stop the official recording and then keep going with questions informally for you know as much time as the speakers have time to hang out with us. Does that sound good? Um, okay, I'm gonna, all right.